Okay, everybody, it's 6.59, give or take a little bit, close enough to seven o'clock. I apologize, I had made my only mistake as president this year, I forgot the gavel. We're called to order at seven o'clock. Do what? You're not supposed to hear it in here, this goes to Zoom, so I'll talk louder. Anyway, um, welcome to the meeting, Zoom folks, welcome to the meeting. Steve, SP, it's good to see you. Uh, I know you had some stuff come up, and so you had to Zoom in from home. The new secretary, the new Steve um, Thompson N7TX had a business thing that he did not expect that uh, came up tonight, so he's not here. I am because I wore the jacket and brought the cookies. So by way of introduction, my name's John N7NWL. I'm the president, so I get to do all of this stuff. And if something goes wrong, then I get to be the one that has to resolve it and gets the blame for it. Moving on from there, let's do the uh, in-person uh, introduction, starting with Jim, then we'll do the Zoom folks. Jim, Kilo Charlie one, bravo, bravo. Larry, WO7R. Bill, Alpha Alpha 4, Quebec. Gary, KC7CS. Richard, N7NT. Alan, N7UJJ. Mike, N7MW. Reinhard K seven R G G. Ingrid W seven I S G. Brian W seven J E T. Norm N I N A V. Uh, Ron W A zero K D S. Uh, Thomas N E seven X. Bob K seven B H M. Virgil, case of NVZ. Thank you, everybody. And the folks on Zoom, if you would let us know your name and call sign, please. Steve, and K7SB. 7, WB8BHN. Mike, Roger, KF9D. And a double, I'm Jim and 7 us Nice to see everybody. And I've got two guests here. Mike K7ING. And this is Bob in NA7RH. Israel K7NO. Did we hear from Mike uh, KC7V? Yeah, I'm here. KC7V, Mike. Sorry about that. Okay, so that takes care of us, takes care of you. Um, Alan in 7 ujj you're actually a guest, I believe. Welcome. Uh, to our little meeting thing. Thank you, we appreciate you being here. Basically what the agenda is gonna to be tonight is uh, a similar repeat from last time. We're gonna do the meet and greet and socializing, which we've done. Meeting started at seven o'clock. We did the introductions. The program is going to be the next thing, which is gonna be a summits on the air and a parks on the air thing that Brian uh, W7JET is gonna present. And he's brought some show and tell things. They are not the door prizes. He and I have had that discussion. Um, Brian's been licensed since 1989, and he started as a technician or, or something and upgraded to technician, uh, then general, then extra. He's got a multitude of hobbies, including um, HF operators, operations while hiking, um, with a main focus, having shifted to operating on summits on the air and parks on the air due to HOA restrictions and things like that, which some of us are, are very familiar with. Anyway, Brian is one of the relative few in the summits on the air um, group to have achieved the Mountain Goat Award, which is uh, earned by, by earning a thousand soda points. And I don't understand completely what goes into that, but Brian is kind of progressive. So he's, not, he's done it not once, he's done it not twice, he's done it three times, which is a lot of work and we do appreciate all that you put into that. Um, he's a longstanding member of several amateur radio clubs, and he's going to be sharing a whole bunch of experiences on all sorts of things with us. So, Brian, I'm going to turn the mic off, get out of your way, and it's all yours. All right, it's my first time using a lapel mic. I feel like a motivational speaker. <laughs> um, so... Summits on the air, parks on the air. They're both portable operations activities. You can actually, both of them, you can really drive to the top. There's many summits around Arizona that you don't have to actually 
pack anything out. You can pull right up, open up the back of the car, throw out a table, and you're operating. Um, I have two general setups. I used to, my, my activations have gotten lighter and more efficient over the years. Like with everything, when, when you first start out, you're like, oh, that's cool, that's cool, that's cool, that's cool. Let me add all that, let me add all that. And before you know it, my pack is like 50 pounds. And I'm hauling that up a hill through brush. And I'm like, this is not good. I got to get smaller, 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 smaller. So this is pretty much everything I carry right here uh, for, for summits on the air. I'll, I'll go through it all in a little bit once we get past some of the, the, uh, the nuances of soda and, and the, uh, the um, point system and mountains and how all that stuff works. But ultimately, everything that's right here is divided into two categories, the stuff I need to get on the air and the stuff I need to survive if something bad happens to me. Um, because some of the places that I go to in Arizona are very remote. Um, there's not any cell, there's no cell service. There's not even sometimes repeater coverage. So you're down to your last resort, which is uh, a personal locator beacon. I'll explain that in a little bit. And uh, some basic first aid supplies and other things to make sure that I can survive for about 24 to 36 hours. Because generally in the state of Arizona, if something bad happens to you in a remote area, if you can call for help, you're out in about 24 to 36 hours. Someone's going to come rescue you. So we'll get we'll get back to that in a little bit. Um, parks. Zoom people, are you hearing me? Yes. Okay. Yes, we are. Um, parks on the air. So this, I kind of divided it into two tables. This is more what I call my QRO setup. I generally only operate about four watts when I'm doing summits on the air. Parks on the air. I have an FT817 and a hard rock amp that I built. And that's running about 60 watts when I'm going full tilt boogie. Um, most of my activations when I'm doing soda, it's very rare that unless I'm on FM on two meters, I'm usually only running CW at about four watts on a three band radio. Over here, occasionally I'll plug in the microphone and actually do some sideband, but soda turned me into a CW addict and now I primarily operate CW most of the time. Um, so if you could bring up the, let's see, bring up the slide deck for me real quick and I'm gonna have you advance to a spot on there where I can show the points, because I'm pretty sure that's on there. So you should say, so share screen. screen. Okay. So this slide deck is from a presentation I did for the ARRL Learning Network when it first started out about three years ago now. So some of the stuff in here is good, some of the stuff's a little older. Uh, that's actually what my mountaintop setup looks like. So if you've worked me on the air, this is from a peak called Salt River Peak, and it's up uh, north of Globe on the way to Roosevelt Lake. Um, there was nothing to tie the antenna to, so that's my backpack and my hiking pole stabilizing the antenna. And it's kind of hard to, to tell, but the winds were howling at about 25 to 30 miles an hour up there, and that's why you can sort of see the flags doing their thing. Yeah, next slide. The, so it's the soda flag, the Arizona state flag, and the United States flag, and I have them in the proper order on the line. And that's another picture in the same area. This was actually the first trip I used the four the four watt QRP radio on when I was just starting to get comfortable enough with CW and and actually talk to people. Keep going. That's snow up in Flagstaff. That's uh, about four feet of snow on a hill called Forty Nine Mountain that overlooks I forty in the parks area. Um, it started snowing, it's doing an additional four inches once we got up on top. That hill normally with no snow takes about 15 to 20 minutes to get on top. It took us three hours that day because the snow was so deep. So um, soda started in the, uh, in the UK in the late 90s. A bunch of guys were just going up on hills doing playing radio and someone had the bright idea that they should turn this into something. So they came up with this point scheme and how to operate it and the rules and, and, and codified it into an actual activity that could spread. So it started off in the UK and little by little it moved, it spread out. And it eventually made it to the United States in uh, the, the late 2000s. And it started in Arizona around 2010 was when we got our first set of summits. Um, summits on the air is basically a, port. it encourages portable radio operating from a mountaintop. For soda, you have to be on portable power. If you plug it in or it runs on gasoline, it's no good. The antenna has to be um, freestand. It has to be attached to something other than a vehicle. So you can't attach it to your vehicle. It can, whatever else around it is fine. If there's a bench there, the bench is cool. 
Um, and uh, it has to be from a designated summit. So they use the rule of John. Anybody familiar with the term the rule of John? So somebody somewhere came up with this algorithm, this idea of if the summit has this much prominence and this height over terrain, it's considered a peak. And if it doesn't fall into the rule of John, it doesn't qualify as a soda peak. And then they created this database based on um, MSL, mean sea level elevation, for the point value. So you have a, a summit in Flagstaff that's 10,000 feet, but the prominence around it is only 700. That's a 10 point summit because it's above 7,000 feet. It doesn't matter that it's only 700 feet above the surrounding terrain. Everybody understand that? Okay. <laughs> um, there's lots of awards. I said, I'm a, I'm a mountain goat. I'm also uh, a uh, shack sloth. Shack sloth is the guy that hangs out and chases. Mountain goat's the guy that goes up on the mountain and activates. There's awards for um, com soda completes. So what a soda complete is that you've activated the summit and then you've also worked that summit as, an, as, a, as a chaser from home. Um, there's uniques. So when I first, one of the unwritten rules when we first started SOTA in Arizona, when the when the, the it first started, Pete, WA7JTM, which a lot of you guys that are VHF people will know who that is, was the first uh, mountain goat in Arizona. I was the second. And between him and I, there was kind of an unwritten rule that all the summits for your first thousand were going to be unique, meaning I only activated them once till I had the, the first thousand points. So the first 127 summits that I went on top of, I'd only been on them once by the time I completed my mountain goat status. Now I've repeated them because that, that was over. Um, and I think after my second or third activation, everything was 100% CW after that because I finally got over the, the fright. I started out at like a painful, agonizing 12 words a minute. I describe it as like people that are fluent language speakers, bilingual, and they're listening to somebody that is trying to order something off the menu and it's like spit it out already. That's kind of how my CW was when I first started it. <laughs> when I first started out, it's gotten a lot better. Um, so let's see, equipment. We'll go through that in a little bit and safety, we'll go through that in a little bit too. Go ahead and move on. Uh, let's see, so this is a little bit about what I was talking about with regards to the status, a lot of, some of this data is not good. I haven't updated the slide deck, it's just old. The, the, the numbers are a lot more. It just keeps growing exponentially. Go to the next one. Um, talked about that, go to the next one. Uh, next one, um, next one, talked about that. Next one, um, next one. So safety. Um, Former public safety. I was a, a EMT paramedic in Newark, New Jersey for 10 years. I've been on the going to get somebody end of things. So I'm very sensitive to that. Um, one of the things I, I, you, you got to keep in mind is whether you want to be rescued or not, if somebody calls for help for you, we're not stopping till we find you. And sometimes what, what us coming to get you can be risky and people get hurt. So you want to make it as easy as you can for the person that's coming to look for you to find you. So one of the things I, I talk about is know where you're going, know how to get in touch with the agency that's responsible for the area that you're going to, and then make sure you've got a good bit of information with somebody who's not there with you that knows what you're wearing, what your vehicle is like, where you might be parked, what supplies you have, and, uh, and just general information about you, but they have it written down so they can read it off to somebody. So one of the things, like let's say right now, I'm up in Apache County, up by Sholo, and I told my wife, if I'm not home by, if you don't hear from me by nine o'clock tonight, something is wrong, call for help. Nine o'clock at night rolls around, and she says, I don't know where he is. She dials 911 from the house. Mesa Fire Department answers that call. She goes, hi, my husband's missing up in Sholo, Arizona, and he's, on, he's supposed to be on top of Ortega Mountain. The dispatcher goes, what? So now she's got to get up on the computer and go, okay, let's see. All right, I think that Sholo is Apache County. I got to, so all this time gets wasted now while she's transferring the call to the public safety agency that's responsible for that call. So they finally get the call. That's a local. Now they go, okay, well, we know where Ortega Mountain is. That's not us. That's White Mountain Apache. So now it goes over to White Mountain Apache. White Mountain Apache goes, well, that's not really ours either. That's the Apache County Sheriff's Office. Now it goes over there. They finally get it. They're like, oh, you know what? That's also a search and rescue deal. We got to call DPS. So that goes. So this is all going on while you're freezing to death up on top of a mountain. 
So one of the things I, I, I stress for people is where you're going, make sure you know a number for the county sheriff or whoever might be responsible for that area primarily. And usually in Arizona, it's gonna be the county sheriff's department. So I have the seven digit number available for somebody that knows where you're going that can call that agency and say, hey, my husband's overdue, my wife's overdue, they, she was supposed to, I was supposed to hear from by this time. They're driving a white Toyota FJ. They're on this mountain. This is the road they thought they were going to be on. He's wearing these clothes. He has this equipment. He should be good for this amount of time. He does this with his radio. He does that. He has a phone. He has this. He has this. He has this. Um, that way they can come find you because that's the key. You want to get found. I, on a non-soda hike, and I'll, I'll tell this story really quick. I got this great scar right here on my arm. So about three years ago, I was doing an exercise hike, not soda, right behind my house on past, right before sunset, beautiful day. I watched the sun go down, hiked this trail a million times, going up the side and a rock moved that never moved before. And I fell backwards eight feet right on my elbow and shattered my elbow an hour before sunset, broke both bones. I had an extra elbow in my arm. <laughs> so fortunately in my regular pack, I carry things. This is a SAM splint. I, it's a formidable splint to put around your arm because one of the things, as long as I can self-rescue, I'm gonna be in a good place. So I make sure I can splint my leg. I have a big roll of duct tape so I can basically make a cast for my foot so I can hopefully drag myself out of somewhere and get to a place where I can be found. But I took one of these, I splinted my arm, I taped it up. I almost blacked out about three times because the pain was unbelievable. And then I slung it and hiked two miles out in the dark and drove myself to the emergency room. Um, but it's because I had all the gear with me and I don't want to be, because I live right by this mountain. I've, every weekend I see the sheriff's office up there with a helicopter taking somebody off the mountain because somebody gets hurt almost every weekend on a nice weekend. And I don't want to be that guy. So I decided I was going to get myself out come hell or high water. I got myself out and got to the, got to the hospital. It took three months off of work. I've got a replacement radial head and a plate in my arm. Um, it, was, it was not a good time. I also learned that I don't like... Um, uh, opioid painkillers. We'll never take one ever again. Worst experience of my life. <laughs> um, I don't know how people can become addicted to those anyway. Uh, but my point is, if you got the right gear and you got the right mindset and you got a plan, you can, you can if something goes wrong, you just got to keep your head and have a plan and have the, the proper equipment. If I'm hiking with, with more than one person, and again, it's a remote area, some places I won't do activations unless I have somebody with me simply because of the danger of going in there by myself. So before we even go, if the person's never hiked with me before, we have a plan. We talk about um, expectations for if ha something happens, what's gonna happen. I go through my safety equipment, how to use it, so they know how to use it if I'm unable to tell them for some reason, um, and the other way around. And I'm not trying to scare anybody, but I'm just trying to get you thinking that if you do decide to go do something like this, even if you're going out in your vehicle into a remote area, you hit a, a soft spot and the vehicle rolls, out, rolls over. Something happens, you know, this can happen to you. So this is stuff you got to think about when you're going out to do it. Be your, be your own advocate, be, your own, be your, your own rescuer, because you don't know how long it could take for help to get there. So off of the safety stuff, um, just bring the appropriate food, water, shelter. Some of these hills, you know, you're on the ground, it's 80 degrees down on the ground, and at night it drops down to freezing up on top of the mountain. Make sure you have warm clothes, just plan appropriately. Know, know, what your, know your limitations. Next slide. So again, just more of what we we're talking about. You know, like when I'm hiking in town here, I don't bring, most of this stuff doesn't come with me. If I'm on a summit like Piestua or um, Lookout Mountain or uh, Camelback or South Mountain, because Frankly, as long as I have enough water, the cell phone's going to work. It's a, it's a relatively safe trail. There's lots of people around. So I, I tone down or I, I throttle back the, the I'm in trouble. Uh, what am I going to do if I get into trouble uh, plan a little bit? That's a picture. I was actually doing a summit activation when I was at work. I happened to be in San Diego. And this is, I think it's called Porter Mountain. I can't remember. It's a radio site in San Diego that overlooks uh, one of the airports. And I was up there doing running code on 40 meters and all of a sudden there's a helicopter and I watch him go over, he flies straight over the top. And then for those that fly helicopters who have been in them before you land on like a pinnacle or an, or an area where there's, there's no true helipad, you do what's called a high surveillance, which is a high loop and then a low loop. And on both of those, you're looking down to see if you're gonna hit something or if there's anything, if there's any obstructions before you land. And I watched him go over and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. He's maybe they're checking out what's going on. And I 
watched him come over and he did the high surveillance and then he came over again and did the low surveillance. I'm like, I think he's landing up here. And sure enough, they landed. Two paramedics jumped out with a stretcher. It turned out about a hundred yards down the trail from where I was activating, some guy had a seizure on the trail and they were medevacing him off the mountain. So it does happen. Uh, so we talked about that earlier. Oh, my one thing, so repeaters. Repeaters other than um, satellites are a no-no for summits on the air. So you can do summit activations via satellites, but you can't do them via terrestrial repeaters. You can drum up interest and tell people to call over to Simplex, which I've done before, but you can't um, actually make, the, make a valid activation on the repeater. Radios, we all know portable radio gear. I'll go through my stuff in a little bit, but that's some of the stuff that was out at the time. The 705 was not out yet, so that's why it's not on the list. That's very popular now. That's my UKIT's radio up on top of one of the mountains. Go ahead. Um, just the different types of dipoles. I use a link dipole. The NFED half wave is really popular. And then there's other commercial antennas that people use. The Wolfberg recoils are really popular with the POTA people. I like simple. My antenna, I built it for about $20 and I used an activation number 18. It's been on almost 300 summits now and in four countries and, a, and 18 states. So it works just fine for what I did it with. And I'll, I'll set up the whole radio setup for you here in a little bit. Continue on. Uh, apps. So there's tons of apps. Um, I don't have the POTUS stuff on here, but I'll bring the, I'll have Virgil bring those up in a minute. You know the website, right? So on your phone, there's all kinds of stuff. If you have Apple, there's stuff that's Apple specific and there's stuff that's iPhone specific. A great logging program that I started using. I used to log everything on paper and there's a log out now that's specifically tailored for soda and POTA called HamRS. Um, and it's fantastic. It's, it works really well. It makes it so much easier. You can set up the whole ADIF file and send it right off. It's really easy to use. I like using that a lot. The websites. So this is the websites for SODA. SODA is completely run by volunteers and volunteer money. So there's three different websites for SODA, depending upon what you're looking to do. And that's because people are doing it out of the goodness of their heart. That's why it's not codified under one website. So the soda.org.uk is the main website about the program and data. Soda Watch is the spotting page. The Soda database is where you log your contacts on. Mm -hmm. So big thing for, for the difference between Soda and POTA for chasers. In Soda, both, uh, both people have to, log, <laughs> have to log the contact. So if you work a Soda contact to get credit for it, you have to submit a log yourself. For POTA, the activator is the only one responsible. You don't have to do anything. All you have to have is an account set up and it just shows up. Um, and then soda maps, soda map is, is, a, is an interactive map. So let's say you're going somewhere and you're like, hey, are there soda summits around there? You can bring the map up, put in the zip code of the area you're going to, set a range in either kilometers or meters, the size of the circle and the, the dimensions of the circle you want, and it'll give you all the summits in that area. And then you can click on them and get more information about them. Go ahead. Um, VHF, UHF contesting. I know there's a bunch of people in this room that have worked me during VHF contest in Arizona uh, for two meters. During January, the soda group puts on as many summits as they can. I've had a lot of luck with it. I, I didn't do this year because of a, a job change. I didn't do any of the, really any contesting this year because I was too busy. But the previous year, I, I won uh, for QRP for Portable for North America in the June and September contests in 22, I think, 20 or 23, or 21, excuse me, 22, I didn't do anything. Um, and then there's a bunch of uh, local act, um, or arm or region specific uh, contests, act, activity periods that they'll sponsor. Arizona, we do the 10 point madness, which is usually in September. And as many operator activators as we can muster up, get on top of 10 point summits around Arizona and activate. It's a lot of fun. It's kind of, it's, I tell everybody it's a f it's field day and a mini D expedition rolled all into one. It's a lot of fun. Go ahead. So these are just the awards. These are all the different awards that are available. Um, they're all available on the SOTA website. When you upload your log, it automatically tells you if you qualified for something. And if you wanna get a certificate, you can go and pay for it or, or uh, get one. The, the, the POTA group 
they have a generator that automatically generates and you can print it out yourself if you're into um, hanging up that kind of paper. The two glass blocks in the corner are the, um, the Mountain Goat and the uh, Shack Sloth Awards for your initial. Okay, so I talked about chasing, activating, alerting. So alerting, um, and this, this is gonna be covered with POTA and SODA as well. So with POTA and SODA, you can post your activation that you're gonna do and the time, mountain, frequencies, everything. And one of the nice things is if, you do, if you're a CW guy, the RBN gate will pick you up and the SODA and, and the POTA page as well is looking for your spot. And as soon as it picks up you calling CQ, it automatically spots you on the on the page on the summit that you're on that you're that you're calling. So you get spotted automatically, which is great for from a from a especially for Soda from an activator point of view. Also on Soda, you can actually spot yourself through APRS if you don't have any cell coverage. So you can get on APRS as a special string you send once you register with the gateway. You send the APRS out, and boom, that'll actually that'll also spot you as well. So it makes it a little easier for people to find you. Um, spotting for phone is, I think, a must, especially if you're QRP, because you're a very quiet voice in a big C. Main thing with soda is it's super addictive. This is the, so this is looking up on the, from the top of 5024, which is the high point by Flatiron, and that's the Flatiron looking down on it, for those that are familiar with it. If you're not, that's the mountain on the superstitions. And I took that, it was about three years ago. So remember that when we had the really cold May, it was only like in the 70s for most of May? I did that was when I activated that summit. It was a, it was like 75 degrees. I started out at nine in the morning. It was a great day. Go ahead. And that's just another that's Pass Mountain, which is right behind my house. And that's looking up toward the four peaks. And this is actually members of the Superstition Amateur Radio Club. We were doing um group activations before I had made a job change every once a month on a Saturday, anybody from the club that was interested that wanted to go do soda, we'd haul 10, 15 people up on a nice wide summit and just pass the radio around and let everybody get their first activation in. And that's that. So let's bring up the POTA um, page just so I can talk about the POTA stuff a little bit. Anybody have any questions, by the way? I'm, I'm sorry. Sure. Hold on. Take a mic. First is a is a comment. Sodawatch.org is no longer functional. Okay. It's and the other is now? yeah, something like that. Yeah, Soda Watch three, I think, is what it's up to. The other is you had up there as an example various HTs six meter FM. Have you ever made a six meter FM contact? Yes. On a soda peak? Yes, I have. Oh, cool. Yes. I got Pete and I did one with the eight seventeen using that stupid antenna that's on it that I don't okay. carry anymore. <laughs> Um, you, you want to know? Uh, my question has to do with the battery technology. I, I know, you know, I've thought about this. I don't know if I'll ever do it, but one of the things that slows me down the most is how you do the battery. And you've got a nice little box there. So this this is for my my POTA activations, and this is a twelve amp hour lithium uh, lithium iron phosphate battery. I'm gonna go ahead and give it to you. Okay. Okay. That's twelve amp hours. Um, okay, so, so how much time. operating time would that be on like a on KX3817? This, on, this, on this radio, uh, with the amplifier, that's probably about five to six hours of operating time. Okay. And without the amp, I assume it's much longer? Yeah, days. Okay. And then when on soda, I tune, soon you take a smaller battery? Yeah. I'm going to show you the soda stuff in a minute. You know, that's, so this is the POTA table. I'll go with it. I'm going to take the soda stuff and I'm actually going to set up my station. Um, let me test the mic up for you. Um, I was going to go to Pagosa Springs, Colorado, and there's some mountaintops over there. Yeah, absolutely. And there. when there was a couple that I picked outside of Pagosa Springs, I found out that you couldn't get on the mountaintop because it was Indian land. Oh, yes. And so the question I have is, how do you find out if the mountains are private? You can because on the website it didn't state that you needed permission to get on those mountains. And then when I drove over there, I found out I couldn't get on. It was kind of a bust. Okay, so let, me, let me explain that a little bit. Oh, I'll turn that off. Um, so one of the things you'll run into, and that's good for bringing that up, thank you. In Arizona, we have Indian reservations. There's a lot of them, um, especially up in the Shoal area. There's a bunch of really great summits. And even right here in, in the Salt River uh, Pima Indian community, there's soda summits. and down on the other side, down by the Gila River Indian community, there's soda summits. And those are not accessible by us unless you have a permit. 
there was one summit in the White Mountain Apache right behind the Honda Casino uh, called Cooley Mountain that we used to be able to activate. And I've activated it. You can go into the, you used to be able to go into the gas station at the casino there and they, you pay 10 bucks. They give you a, a hiking pass for the day and you can go up to the top of the mountain. It's an old AT&T long line site. You set up up there and operate. Drop me, Virgil. <laughs> Um, but they've since gotten rid of that. So one of the, and uh, reason why I'm bringing that up is one of the things you can do to look at a summit to decide how activatable is this summit? Does it look really, oh, and this looks really easy. Why? And then you look and you're like, okay, how many activations has it had? Because if you look on the soda, zero, right? So if you, if you see one that looks like really sweet and it's got a zero activation count on it, that should be a clue that there's probably a reason why, because when it looks that sweet, there's somebody like me that was like, man, I want to get up on top of that. And they couldn't for, for various reasons, either the terrain access or whatever. So sometimes there'll be cautions on there, but sometimes there's nothing. What you can do is look at the, the summit itself. Some of, sometimes um, there's a lot of groups.io for different regions. If you go onto the SOTA website, if it's in like Colorado, you're going to look for W0C. And in the, the paperwork for the arm, there's a big document that you can download. And in there, there'll be a contact information for the person that's in charge of that, that section. And you can email them and say, hi, I'm coming in from out of town. I'm looking at these summits. I know they haven't been activated. Can you tell me why? And they might say, hey, nobody's activated because we got no something. We got no activators in that region of the state. Go for it. Or they'll tell you, just like you found out, hey, it's Indian Reservation. You can't go there. So yeah, there's there's definitely nuances to activate. And like on the Indian reservations, do not screw around, especially up in the Sholo area. They will take your car, they'll take your equipment, they will take everything from you um, and confiscate it all. So don't 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 trespass on the Indian land without permission. All right. So let's bring up the POTA website. We'll talk about POTA a little bit. Just some of the differences. So okay. I'm logged in. Yeah, you're fine. This is good. So go to the um, go to the the um, oh, I don't have a no. Go down to uh, go down to your awards page. We'll talk about the awards. So scroll all the way down left side. My my oh, awards. Oh, my awards. Yeah. Okay. So Hoda's really big into the awards and all kinds of stuff, and it happens automatically. So parks on the air. Generally, the parks that are that qualify are state parks. National parks, national forests, historic sites that that they've deemed for the list that are that are current. So in Arizona, I think we've got 125 qualifying POTA locations in the state of Arizona. We've got 3,800 summits that qualify. Now, what's cool is POTA and SOTA, you can actually do them together. So I do a lot of POTA by default because a lot of the SOTA summits are in national forests and they in turn qualify as a POTA activation as well. So I'll upload my log to both locations and you get a twofer out of it. Um, sometimes they're standalone. I don't do that many standalone summits, but like right here in the immediate area, if you wanted to go do a POTA right now, you can drive out to Lost Dutchman State Park and set up on a nice picnic table there for seven bucks and you can operate for a little while and just hang out and have a good time. Look at the Superstition Mountains, it's beautiful. Or you can go out to Boyce Thompson Arboretum, or you can just drive out into the Salt River Canyon wilderness uh, this is all over Canyon area, which is Tonto National Forest, pull over to the side of the road, throw up an antenna, and you're good to go. Casa Grande Ruins, National Monument. You can drive up the 17 and go to Montezuma's Castle or um, Prescott National Forest. Or if you feel like going out toward Globe, you've got the um, the Tonto Cliff Dwellings up, up, up by Roosevelt Lake. And then when you're done with that, you can go across the street and go into the Tonto National Forest and activate Tonto. you got two activations right there. POTA spits out awards for everything. They're really big into celebrating people's activities. Good thing is, I said, if you do SOTA, it qualifies as POTA most of the time. Like Humboldt Mountain is in the Tonto National Forest. That is a SOTA summit. You can drive all the way up to the top. There's a nice big spot to set up on next to the Sheriff's Department uh, um, tower right by the radome. Set up a table, and you can operate POTA and SOTA QRL all you want. You don't have to get yourself sweaty. You can bring whatever you want, set up a easy up, and have a great time. The road up to the top is paved. They maintain it really well. There's an FAA radar site up there, and they visit it every day. So it's a great spot to go activate. It's an eight-point summit. Do it during the summertime. You get three bonus points for it. And you also get quali you also qualify the, the activation for Tonto National Forest. Arizona 75. 75. Okay. That was more. That's good. All right. Here's the list of Arizona. Okay. 
Um, I think I've activated like 25 now. Most of my most of my soda my POTA activations are usually joined at the hip with a soda activation. I do a couple. Of, I do occasionally do a, a solo POTA just because I have nothing better to do. Like I fly for work, and a lot of times I'm sitting in places where I've got nothing better to do. Today, so I bring that setup with me, and I'll, I'll go operate like the. When I go to Safford, if the weather's bad, I can't go up on top of um, Mount. Um, I'm sorry, what's the other one over there? Guthrie. Um, I'll go over and I'll activate either um, uh, the lake or I go over and do uh, the heel of box uh, riparian preserve. And you can activate the, the POTUS as many times as you want. That's another thing about soda. And I, I'm jumping around here, but it just dawned on me that I didn't mention that earlier. Soda summits, you can only activate them once a year for points as an activator. So once you've activated it, the next time you activate it, uh, it doesn't qualify. So that change that that resets at the change of the year, not 12 months later. So if you activate in December, in December, if you say you want to go on New Year's Eve and start activating at four o'clock in the afternoon Arizona time on a summit. As soon as the clock strikes five, it's the new year, and that summit resets, and you get you get you get credit for two activations in one day. A lot of people do that on New Year's Eve. Yeah. So there's a map, all the yellow dots. If you click on the dot, it'll tell you the the uh, designator. POTA uses this, this K system. I'm not a big fan of it because everything in the United States is a K and a number. So if you look at the K and the number, I can't approximate it to anywhere in the country. I just know it's a number. At least with our with the soda, it's a it's it, it sort of corresponds to the region. So W7A is what all of our summits start with in Arizona. So you know it's Arizona. You're gonna point a beam, point it toward Arizona. With soda or with POTA, you really don't know. You can guess by the call sign, but even that isn't always so good. So those are all the dots around the Phoenix area. So that yellow dot that's closest to Gilbert over there is Lost Dutchman. Um, the one up by the lake, that's Tonto National Monument. The other one is Tonto National Forest. The one just south of the 60 there, that is Boyce Thompson, Casa Grand Ruins. And then I think that's, uh, what's that? Yeah, Sonoran Desert Preserve. And then they just go all the way out. They're all over the place. And it's a good way to just get out and have some fun. If you want to get out of the shack and just have a nice day operating outside, set a table up. It's fun. I got my wife into it. She's a, a general class ham and she, she enjoys going out and operating with me. She doesn't need to do phone though, because all we want to do is talk about our medical problems and what we did in the bathroom this morning. So she only does FT8. <laughs> um, but. Yeah. So. Up until about six months ago, POTA, when you did an activation, you had to, to format your log in a specific ADIF uh, format for the message, for the, the file, and email it to somebody, and they would upload it for you. They finally uh, created a portal on the website where you can upload your log now yourself. Much better. Um, I was actually a lot more reluctant to send logs because there was always a problem with how the, the format that I sent them in. Now you don't have to worry about it. just does it for you. Yeah, see. Um, POTA, that's the other thing. For POTA for an activation, you have to have 10 contacts for this for the activation to count. So if you have less than 10, it's a bust. You don't get any credit for the activation. For soda, it's four. You need four contacts for the summit to activate. To get the points for it, one to qualify the summit. So let's say you're going to a summit and you've never been activated before. You get up there, you make one contact. That's all you can make. The radio broke. Nobody wanted to talk to you. They figured out you were ugly. Whatever. Um, the uh, the the one contact will give you credit for the summit. So if it's a summit that you're never going to want to ever go back to again because it was the most miserable six miles of your life, and I'm like, I'm never doing this again. I got here. I got the picture on the top. I feel really good about myself. No one else is ever going to come up here again. I got it activated. I'm good. We'll get the points, but at least you get to have your name on there as the first person that activated that summit. But you get four contacts, then you get the points for the summit as well. So you might as well make it worthwhile. You'd be well. You'd be surprised for guys. For guys. For guys do so. You're 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 so you're using. You're an inexperienced operator. You drag your 817 up there. You only know phone. The antenna you got is some magic antenna that somebody told you at a ham fest is the best thing ever. You know, it's this little thing that's like this tall on the ground and you're trying to talk to somebody in 80 meters. We all know how bad that's going to go. They don't, they don't make, they, they're, then they finally get somebody on two meter FM that answers them and that was it. So yeah, it, it, it can happen. <laughs> it happens. They say it, phone, phone for QRP, as we all know, is, is it, it takes, it takes effort and skill. It's not something you can just, go out and do and get very lucky with all with the with the solar cycle picking up that's probably going to change a little bit 
but when I started out, the solar cycle was not good. <laughs> All right. Um, any questions for anybody on Zoom or in the classroom, in the room here before we're moving on to the next set? Okay, I think we got the, the POTUS stuff done. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how I set up for a soda activation when I get up to the top of the hill. So this is my right here. This represents everything that I need to do is to do HF on a summit. I got my support pole, my radio antenna and battery, and one of my keys is in here, my backup key. I became a bit of a snob recently. I got a Begali uh, single lever adventure and that's in this case. So we'll bring that out in a little bit. But I get up on top of the summit. I'm gonna open up my little case here. Why is it bright orange? Because I had a black one and I dropped it once on a dark summit and it took me 10 minutes to find it. Because <laughs> you'd be surprised how easily things blend in. Everything is bright colors now, including the pole, because this pole used to be black. Same thing, it looks a lot like a stick. When it flies off your backpack and you're looking for it, you're like, shit. It's that screw that drops on the shack floor. Crap, where did it go? Okay, so antenna, this is a link dipole. It's made out of 18 gauge wire that I bought at Fry's Electronics and some RG173 with a BNC connector and some nylon plastic that I made uh, insulators out of. No, it's three bands. It's 10. It's well, this this antenna started its life out as 12, 20, 30, and 40. Then the 12 meters got deleted when 12 meters went away because the, the band just you know wasn't open. So it's just 20, 30, and 40, because this radio here is 20, 30, 40, and 80 meters. It's CW only, no speaker. You have to use uh, earbuds with it. But it does have a key in it, which is nice. So when you want to CQ, you can just hit a button, although that's starting to act up. I paid $250 for this radio. I bought it used off of um, uh, QRZ. The whole set, my HF gear weighs four pounds. So that's about what I'm, that's all, that's all I'm carrying when, if I'm just doing HF. The radio and a few other things, if I add some other stuff and it adds a little bit more weight, but just to do HF, that's about four pounds. I use a uh, bio uh, three amp hour lithium iron phosphate battery. This battery with that radio, I charge it once a month. I usually get about 12 two hour activations out of it before it starts to drop down to the level where it might shut off. Because the, uh, the lithium iron phosphate batteries, the controllers that have a protection where about 10 volts, they shut off to protect the cells. And it'll start getting close. And that's about when I have to act, shut it down. So about 12 two hour activations. That seems to be the speed limit on it. So, these are the best things ever. Anybody see these at Home Depot? Gear ties? They, they're they like big bread ties for, you know, for bags, you know, from when you get a loaf of bread. They're really good because you can tie them to anything. So what I'll do in this chair is gonna be my bush. I can take this. Tie it to the chair, pull my top up. So this is a um, $25 Chinese collapsible fishing pole. I buy them in like two or three groups. I take the bottom of it and I put about two or three layers of heat shrink over it to reinforce it and make it stronger. I take the top section out. I get a piece of coat hanger wire. I fashion a hook. I throw some epoxy in there and then throw a piece of heat shrink over the top of it to reinforce it. I generally don't pull that one out that stays inside. That's about 18 feet. And I hang it in an inverted V as you'll see in a second here. So I'm gonna get a little medieval for a second here and start throwing things. So that happens up on the summit, we throw one one way. Throw one the other way. All right, nobody saw me hit the flag. This is, nope, this is just a straight up uh, link dipole. I don't even have a balance on it because I don't run enough power to care about having a balance really. It's like four watts. So what, you know? Nope. I kind of believe because I'm only running four watts, right? So if I use a tuner, that's a, it's not a lot of loss, but for four, it's flat. I actually have the whole antenna tuned. So it's totally flat on uh, all three bands that I use it on. And then I just put it out. That's about how high up it is. Hopefully the chair doesn't flip over. And then normally if I had enough room, 
I'll just stretch the ends out. I use more of those bread ties, the shorter ones, and I'll find a tree or a bush or sometimes just a clump of grass. And I'll wrap it around the grass and put it through the rope loop on the end and secure the end of the antenna. It's a, 60, it's a 40 meter antenna, so it's 65 feet long-ish. Well, so that's the key, believe it or not. I, if you notice how I folded it, I, I pack it like fire hose. Everybody see how, you know, like when you pack fire hose in the truck, I pack it the exact same way. So all I have to do is just throw it out and the whole thing just flails right out. I don't, I don't coil it, I fold it. Do both ends and then I just take it and just, I literally just toss it. And normally, as you can see, I started this, what, three, four minutes ago? From the time I get to the top of the mountain to the time I'm launching RF is less than 10 minutes using this setup. So for the different bands, I've got these links on the dipole and it's just a pair of blade connectors, automotive blade connectors. If I wanna be on 20 meters, I just open up the blade connectors on both ends and I'm on 20 meters now. If I wanna be on 30 meters, I close the blade connector, come down to the 30 meter break and open it up and I'm on 30 meters. If they're all together, I'm on 40. The antenna is, when I made the antenna, I tuned it so that way when each one of these is open, it's on that band. If you look, you can kind of see a spot on here where there's solder and a break in the wire. That's where 12 meters used to be. But when I didn't need 12 meters anymore, I decided to eliminate a failure point in the antenna. And I took it out and just soldered the wires together. Maybe I'll put it back in, I don't know. You know, not appreciably. I mean, sometimes I'll notice a little bit. So this radio is not super sophisticated, but it does have SWR protection in it and it will drop the, um, it'll drop the power down. So my first indication that I have a problem with the antenna is the power is not, it's not putting out full power when I, when I start doing a CQ. The two main things I've had happen with this radio is this has disconnected from the board and this connector got loose. And I've had to make small repairs. Oh, and the volume knob went bad. So I replaced it with a better knob because it's plastic, it's a plastic rheostat going into a thing. I ended up buying a thing, something with a metal shaft and replaced it with, with that. So this radio has been repaired a couple of times in its lifetime. It has an internal battery in it that I kind of use as a backup. Um, it doesn't last very long, maybe 45 minutes. So I only use it as like a, hey, I crap this battery died. I forgot to replace it. But generally I can just plug it into the top here turn it on. I've got 13.2. I'll pass it around for anybody that wants to look at it. That bomber. That you can feel the weight and it's fairly sturdy for what it is. This is another, this is just a, a different version of the same battery. So they, they went to a flat panel. I bought a second one a little while ago because I happened to be doing a summit and that one died on me and I was pissed that I was done for the day because I didn't have a spare battery with me. So I bought a second one and that usually stays in the car. Basic first aid kit, snake bite kit, butt pad, because it helps um, sitting on the ground, your legs fall asleep after a while. This is kind of my ditty bag. So I have um, basic stuff in here, lighters, survival shelter, uh, Siloom sticks, chem lights, if you guys know what they are. Tape, a roll of duct tape and a roll of electrical tape. This is uh, batteries, headlamp, um, and an extra uh, battery for my cell phone. This here is what I would call a last resort item. But it's a is this battery small? I should probably check the battery in this. I guess the battery's dead. All right, well, this is a signal laser. It's a good thing I checked it because I haven't checked it in a while. So this is supposed to be visible out to about 15 miles. So this is about the only time you'd ever see me shining it at an aircraft if, I'm, if I think I'm in trouble. Don't shine a laser at an aircraft. I would not appreciate it unless I was looking for someone, but this is specifically for signaling. So I can shine it day or night and then air, and they'll, the aircraft will it'll get the aircraft's attention.
No, I, if someone's looking for me and they start seeing something flashing at, they're going to probably head toward the flash. And if, and if they're not, if it's law enforcement and they have somebody flashing a laser at them, they're probably going to come look for me because they want to arrest me. So either way, someone's going to come. Um, <laughs> um, so one way or another, you're going to get attention, good or bad, you're going to get some attention. Okay, so after the Tobago and the Grand Canyon, yeah. they fly Grand Canyon. Yeah. And I'll go see an A O K. Yeah. A K. All okay. Yeah. But do most pilots read code? No. No. Quick story back when I was doing my instrument rating in, in the late 90s, nowadays most airplanes have a have an Morse code reader built into it. So when you have a nav aid and you're gonna tune it, it'll tell you that the identifier for the nav aid, you know it's good. Back then you actually had to get the paper chart out if you didn't know the code, look at the chart. And copy the code off the uh, off the the nav aid, and the nav aid sends it about seven words a minute, a three letter identifier, or a two letter if it's an NDD, or a four letter if it's an ILS. I was doing my check ride, and I I was an active general at that point, so I actually knew better. I knew better than I did when I got back into the hobby in 2012 code, and you know I was tuning a VOR for on the check ride. I heard the Sparta VOR identify SAX, and I turned the radio off and kept right on going. And he looked at me, he goes. Is that really how you're going to identify it? He goes, do I, do I fail you right now? Should we go back? Like, what are you talking about? He goes, I, he goes, I didn't see you look at the chart. How do you know that that was, you know, what that was? He said it was Sparta, S-A-X. So he, was, so he tunes, he tunes another, he just tunes a random one that he knows. He goes, what's that? And I'm like, oh, that's uh, whatever it was, Broadway, BWZ. All right, that, that was too easy to try this one. He runs through, he goes, do you know Morse code? I'm like, yeah, I'm an amateur radio operator. Oh, all right. Sorry. Let's continue on. <laughs> um, so let's see. This is another one. This is probably the most important thing I carry. This is the poop tickets. Because sometimes when you got to go, you got to go. So there's toilet paper in here and bags to collect the toilet paper and hand wipes. Um, I talked about the SAM splint earlier. This is my backup should the cell phone fail. It's a paper log. I have a pen in here. This is a tarp. These are um, basically for ice, walking on ice to give you a little bit of traction so you don't slip and slide. These are the flags that were in the picture. This is the PLB, so personal locator beacon. This is the same thing as an ELT in an airplane. The only difference is it's handheld, so they call it a personal locator beacon. It's registered with the US Air Force uh, Search and Rescue in Colorado Springs, so when I push the buttons on this, and it goes off, the, um, this goes to the National um, Search and Rescue Center for the Air Force. They look at it and proximate it to where it is and they call the appropriate agencies in that area that would have responsibility and say, hey, we got a locator beacon going off in your area, go find it. Anybody can buy one, you can buy one. This is about, this is a couple of years old, but it still works just fine. They're about $350. Your register, registration is free and every seven years you need to send it to a company to have the battery replaced and recertified. And every two years you have to re-register it with uh, the search and rescue group. So when you register it, they ask for some basic information. So like mine has three points of contact, my father, my wife, and a another friend. And then I have information in there about the type of activity I do and the equipment I carry. So I'm an amateur radio operator, I beacon APRS, I do all these things. So that way this is all this information they have right away to help them find me because I want to be found. If I'm pushing the buttons on this, this is, I call this the fire alarm. So we get to the last point of I'm hiking with somebody that's never had one of these or doesn't know how to use it. I show them how to use it, you know, put the antenna out like this. This is a GPS antenna and it's to be facing the sky. Flip the top up. There are two buttons on here. I'm not going to actually push them, but you take both those buttons, push them down, hold them at this, hold them down until you see it start flash and then just let it go and make sure it's got a clear vision of the sky um, and that it's probably tied to something. You know, one of the things I talk about with people, like if I'm in a situation with somebody where they're unconscious or they're potentially not going to be able to walk, but I'm going to try and walk for help, I'm going to tie that to them because at least that way you can find them. Yeah. Yep. You get them on Amazon. You can get them just about anywhere. If you just go Google personal locator beacon PLB and those come up, there's also now commercial services available with a subscription, Garmin inReach and Spot. And those have a little bit more sophistication to them. So you can send um, two-way messages on them, depending upon the level of subscription. No, your cell phone, 
Although from what I gather, Apple is coming out with some type of emergency service on their cell phone now that uses satellites, uses the NRAD. I think it's using the NRAD system, um, or, but that it doesn't need anything. It's totally independent. All it needs is a clear view of the sky and the same satellites that are gonna pick up a downed aircraft or a ship sunk it that's going down at sea. It's gonna pick that up also. It's all on the same system. So let's see. Um, Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. This is like I said. This is when I if I'm if I'm pushing that, I'm pretty sure I'm in a I'm I'm in a really bad place. Like if I don't get help, something this is not going to have a good outcome. I can't get anybody on this. I can't get anybody on that. I can't get anybody on the cell phone. I am SOL, and that is the absolute last resort. I'm pushing the buttons on those because if I don't push those and call for the cavalry, this might not have a good outcome. Uh, for pushing those buttons, so I can I I don't know if any if it's ever been used in Arizona for sure at least I know it's not in the ham community but I know up in Alaska it's a fairly regular occurrence up there, and if they push them if the weather's good the Coast Guard's out in like an hour looking for you as soon as they get notified they're launching, and Arizona from what I gather, it's going to go they're going to call the state police first. And then the state police will figure out if it's something that they're going to go to right away with Ranger or if they're going to call the local county and then get and get a Ranger unit going out there as well. Those who don't know what a Ranger is, that's what the state police helicopter is. Right. And that's what they'll do if the weather's good at night. They're not going to they might not send a helicopter into mountainous terrain because that might not end well. Um, that's kind of you know, one of the reasons like, I've had. Behind my house on Pass Mountain, a guy was halfway up the top of the mountain and broke his ankle right at sunset. And they left, they stayed there with him on the mountain. They didn't extract him in the morning because they couldn't get him down off the hill and they didn't want to long line him in the dark. So they stayed up there with him overnight. And as soon as the sun came up in the morning, they helicoptered him off. And that's in town. It was just too risky to do it at night. So it can happen. All right. Um, I have activated, so I, I hiked Humphreys when I first moved out here. I have not been up on it since it became a soda summit. Agassiz is an interesting summit because you have to have a permit to do it. And the only time that the Forest Service will let you walk out to Agassiz is when there's snow on the ground. And the only way to get up there during the winter time is you have to take the chairlift up, but you can't take the chairlift back down. So if you go up there, you have to be able to ski down or you're going to walk down in the snow. So it's nobody's, to the best of my knowledge, nobody has, has successfully activated it. There was someone that did log an activation on it, but when he did it, if he did it, it wasn't a legal activation because he didn't follow the rules. So it got deleted. That's on YouTube. Uh, no, it's in the, no, it, it, Humphreys, no, they're both, they're both in the National Forest. They're both in Coconino. Um, but I said, Agassiz is, 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 is also a, a environmentally protected area because it's it's a special habitat, and that's why they don't want want you hiking on it when there's no snow. I hiked the ABC before they had the borders. Oh, that, took a spot on. that doesn't surprise me at all, Bob. You are, you are. <laughs> <laughs> um. So these little curious antennas here, if you guys have talked to me on either 900 or 1.2, these are probably the beams you've talked to me on. They're little PCB antennas. I didn't bring the HTs with me, but I have two FM HTs of Linkos, and these are the beams I use when I'm using those. They work pretty good. Um, they came, there's a, a uh, so it's this call sign, another WA5VJB. And then this one, I also have transverters for 900 and 1.2. And this one, I think, came with the transverter for the 900 rate, for the nine for the uh, 1.2 tr uh, transverter as well. I didn't bring them with me, but the little one watt transverters for sideband and all that sort of thing. They use one watt, they use draw, uh, the uh, two meter drive. So I think that's everything. I, I, I guess I can show off my key for those that care. So here is, I'm operating on a summit. I made myself a leg strap because it's kind of nice to not be able to have it. So this is a homebrew leg strap. It's a replacement strap for a pilot knee board from a company called ASA. Two pieces of um, roof gusset material for uh, like truss roofs and then a piece of foam rubber. I put the strap through it, riveted it together, painted it, and then put the foam rubber on the other side of it to keep it still. And then here's the key. You know, just sticks right to it and I can operate and I have my hands free so I can CQ, answer the call 
I have both hands to log, and I can go right back down and operate again. And when I go to change the antenna, I just take this off, I can switch bands on the antenna and stick it right back on again. And then the backup key is in here. Any of you ever heard of Palm Radio? So this is a Ambiot key from them called the Pico Paddle. And this was my primary key for a real long time. It's light, it's great key, really a lot of fun, very comfortable to send with. And it sticks to the radio. And then to help out on two meter FM, this is a dual band uh, uh, J pole that I got off of eBay and I've been using it forever. And it's a really good antenna. It works better than beams most of the time. And I just strap it right to the side of the pole and run this down to the HT. It's about, it comes down to about here. And then I have a coax that runs over to the handheld. So I think I've talked long enough. My total, so that, that varies with season and what I'm trying to do. The heaviest pack that I still carry voluntarily. Yes. So it all depends upon what I'm doing. During the summertime or warmer months, I'm usually carrying about a gallon of water. Um, so that's eight pounds right there. And then uh, the radio gear is about four. Some of the cold weather stuff obviously goes away. I still keep a hat and a pair of gloves with me um, and a pair of long underwear. So that way, if I have to get, if it's, if I have to spend the night somewhere, I've got something to help me keep me, you know, warm for the night. Um, and then all this other gear, normal pack, winter pack is about 23 pounds. Summer pack is about 28 pounds. And then if I'm doing the VHF contest and I'm packing it up to the top of the hill, that pack usually weighs just under 50 because I've got that radio over there, not the amp, four transverters, five antennas, and a computer because the VHF contest without a computer, the log is a mess. So I just bring a computer and I use N1MM and I log right on the hill with the computer using N1MM for the VHF contest. Four HT and a bunch of other junk. So that's the heaviest pack I voluntarily carry. Um, and it's usually a short hike. I like to go out on this peak called Dromedary Peak. If you've been up to Superior, as you, you know, everybody know where the Gonzales Pass is? Uh, Hewitt Station Road. You know where the train tracks are that you go to before you go up over the hill into Superior? Okay, so as you're coming to those train tracks, you look to the right and there's a mountain right there on the right side of the road. That is this nice flat area that looks out to the west, out into Phoenix and down into Tucson and everywhere else under the sun. And that's usually where I do the January VHF contest from. I hike up there, it's about three quarters of a mile, just under a thousand feet of elevation. Beautiful view, nice flat summit, great places to set up antennas, and I can just set up up there and operate. And I have, you know, like a 220 uh, beam with the transverter. Most of the time, I literally just put that on top of a barrel cactus and have it pointing horizontal towards Phoenix. I don't even pick it up. That's what you guys, if you've worked me on that, that's what you've worked me on. Most of the antennas are just sitting on top of bushes and stuff, pointing in different directions. And then if I need to move them, I'll pick it up and move it. Uh, questions, anything else? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, guys, so th so the the June and the September the June and the September VHF contests, I stopped operating them from a true summit. I have a little spot by Mount Or now that I go up to, and I set up a table and I I sit in a chair at a table and do those. But the January contest, everybody's up on a hill, so I feel like I need to be a part of that. But the June and, and the September one, I usually will operate those from a table in a nice spot with a good view of the valley. All right. Let me turn mine off here. So the mine's on. So um, let's do about a 15 minute break. Thank you, Brian. That was cool. And I do like the part about driving up to the, you know, setting off the table and all that stuff like that. That's what I will be doing. Um, let's do about a 10 minute break. Let's come back at 815. We got three or four business things we need to go over. Uh, hopefully not too long. So go eat cookies, get something to drink and all that good stuff like that. <laughs>